On November 30th, 1978, I was declared a Partika. I was no longer an orphan for the state of Connecticut, but I am as a child who belonged to a parent, to parents. I was no longer as a child unloved and unwanted, but I was a child that was cherished and I was lavished with love. I was no longer a child that would be shuffled back and forth between foster homes, but I was a son and I had a future. I had a name. When my parents picked me up for the first time, my life changed. I was a sickly little boy who had no idea how my life changed at that moment with the embrace of Jim and Lucy Partika. However, as I have grown and I, as I have become a parent myself, I see how radically my life has changed because they declared me a Partika. And this is the same understanding that we have as Christians. That scripture tells us that we have been adopted by our Heavenly Father. The book of Romans tells us that we were once alienated from God. We were lost and we had no hope of our relationship with God. Our situation was dire. Despite the, the void in our heart, we did not even have a recognition that we were helpless, nor did we have helpless, nor did we have a desire to rectify the situation. And the sobering truth is that we weren't just strangers or orphans, but in fact, we were enemies of God. And not only did we wander from our Heavenly Father, but we fought against Him. We had no relationship, we had no desire, and we had no peace. However, all of this changed with the irresistible grace of our Lord. Over the next three weeks, I want to peer back in the pages of Scripture to see the work of God that He has done to make us and to bring us into the family. Because we often are able to see that joyous moment when conversion happens. When somebody comes from somebody sitting in a pew or in a Bible study or in prayer or when you're sharing your faith, we see that moment when the light comes on and faith floods their heart and they see Jesus for who he is and they follow Jesus. We have the opportunity of doing that in, in a few weeks as we watch brothers and sisters go into the water of baptism saying they follow Christ. But I want to peer back the pages of scripture and see the work of God that is happening behind the scenes. The cultivating of our hearts, the seed that is planted, and as we see the growth as it emerges and pops forth from the soil, it's because of the work of our Heavenly Father, the gardener, the vine dresser, the sower as he works. And we rejoice to see the outworking of the grace of God. So over the next three weeks, we're going to be looking at the various aspects of adoption. Uh, the Greek word adoption is only in five times in the New Testament. Ephesians 1. Romans 8 and Galatians 4. And that just so happens, we're going to, those are going to be our texts over the next three weeks. I know, I'm radical, I mean, you know, I just, you know. But we're going to do that. Today, what we're, my structure will be, through, I'm going to present to you three truths of adoption. And then those implications of, of, of that truth. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at the father of adoption. Our attribute this morning that we're looking at is God is our father. And therefore, that is why we look at the first aspect of our adoption is the father of adoption. But also, we're going to, the second point will be the means of adoption. How does, how does the father work and bring about our adoption? And then ultimately, our third and final point will be the household of adoption. The father, the means, and the household of adoption. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father. Open our eyes to see the blessing of your adoption. Adoption is not simply just bringing a child into our home to feed and to clothe and to love. But Lord, it is a picture of what you have done for us, Lord. You have brought in somebody who was not your own, who rebelled, was a stranger, was an enemy, and you declared them not guilty. 
and you declared them your child. And you were working and refining and disciplining them to make them into your presence, to be like the Heavenly Father. And with joyous hearts, we sing and we shout your praise. O Heavenly Father, the good Father who takes care of his children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first point this morning is the father of adoption. Um, This is an interesting metaphor in the book of Ephesians and Galatians and Romans that Paul uses. He uses adoptions. Now, as the first century readers would have been reading through, they would have been very familiar with adoption. Because in the, in the Roman world, they had what was known as the pater familia. Uh, and, and what it is was the, the, the father who was head of the household. And he was the one who, in the family of the Roman society, was the, was the foundation of the Roman Empire. Its social, its religious, and its political and economic was all based on the family. And uh, the head of the family was the pater, the pater familias. He was the head of the household. He held absolute power and absolute authority in that home. Even under his grown children, it was the pater familia who was in charge. He owned all the property. He was the judge of all the legal relations of the family. And he was also the one who had the ultimate determination of life in that family. One of the historians said that pater familia had the right to even expose his children, to scourge him, to sell him, to pawn him, to imprison him, and in extreme, even to kill him. This is the level of power and authority the pater familia had. Now, to, we are very removed from that, but there is a modern day equivalent that you may know. It would be Vito Corleone. Now, for those of you who have seen the movies, it's The Godfather. The Godfather, Vito, and I think um, the head guy, I can't remember the actor's name, but um, yes, Marlon Brando, he was the one who was in charge of everything. And he called the shots of all his sons. He's the one who says, make them a deal they'll never forget or something. They can't refuse. He was the one who called all the shots. The pater familia was Vito Corleone without the organized crime. Um, and, but, and, and it wasn't as, it was a benevolent, uh, loving one, but there was those who went awry. But he had the power over the family. So we can understand that. And this, in, in that day and age, with disease and with sickness and um, uh, insurrections that would happen, often adult sons would be killed and wouldn't survive. So to be able to continue on the heritage of the family, the, the, the pater familia would adopt grown sons. They would find uh, uh, somebody in, in society that said, this will be the, the son that I adopt to continue my legacy, and he would be the rightful heir he would adopt. And this Roman, Roman understanding of adoption is the very metaphor that Paul uses to explain our relationship to our Heavenly Father, the pater familius. And even in the Greek, when it says God the Father, it says God the pater. The understanding that it is God as our pater familias. He had divine authority uh, as God the Father who called for himself a people to be a part of his household, to be a part of his family. Now, in the book of uh, Ephesians, if you read this through, you see this emphasis. You see God as Father. It mentions it eight times in the book of Ephesians, God as Father, the Father, the Father, continually. You see, even in this chapter, the work and the activity of God the Father. You see, in in verse 4, it's God the Father who elects or chooses. It's God the Father who adopts. It's the God the Father in verse 7 who redeems and he forgives. It's God the Father who gives grace in verse 8. And then verse 9, it's God the Father who reveals his will. These are all the work and the activity of God and the emphasis. God as Father is significant in the text. And he's also significant in our relationship in our lives. So what we need to see 
is that the work of the Father is the one who secured and declared our adoption and our relationship with him. I want you to notice in Ephesians 1 verse 4. Or verse starting with verse 8. Blessed be the God and what? Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And these blessings, he says, these are words of worship and of praise. And he's, he's giving God the Father glory. And then he says specifically, how does he give him glory? Verse 4. Even as he chose us in him. He chose us in him. Those who God has chosen, it talks about that out of all the, the, the created beings that God has chosen and brought Christians into his family to be associated with his family, to be called his children. It is the work of the Father. It is sovereign God choosing and, and a people for himself. Now, I want you to notice also when this happened. This is, uh, notice in, in verse 4, it says, even as he chose us in him, when? Before the foundations of the world. Now, God creating a family for himself was never plan B. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a plan B. Plan A got messed up. All right, Gabriel, let's, let's start concocting plan B. This was always the plan of God to bring people into his family. And he, it is the free act of God where it's not contingent upon a person who is dying, tied down by circumstances or things that force him to do something. God is completely free in his, his choosing and his activity and will unfolding the plan before the foundations of the earth. And he has multiple objects and, and things at his disposal. Now this, this activity of God choosing and electing is nothing new to the New Testament or nothing new to this doctrine. This is something that all throughout scripture we see where God is working. All from the plan of God that was begun in Genesis chapter 12 when God created a people for himself through the lineage of Abraham. And that was the Jewish people who God said, I, in, in Deuteronomy 14, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of the peoples who are on the face of the earth, God chose this ragtag group of nomads in the middle of the desert, the descendants of Abraham, and said, I will be your God and you will be my people. And it said, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness because God said, I will work through you. He chose Abraham and... For what purpose? We see uh, in that why has he chosen uh, Christians? Why has he chosen the church? Why has he chosen those in the New Testament who put their faith in Christ? Why? Verse 4, that we should be holy and blameless before him. The work of Christ that he did, the, the God the Father, that said for the reason that you are to be holy and blameless. Despite the fact that Romans tells us all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have traded the glory of God for their own glory and have sinned and have a, a wicked and wretched hearts. God chose to be able to say I am choosing and I am working and I am calling for myself a people to be what? To be holy and to be blameless. He decreed our holiness, we see in verse 4. But notice, in, in, and it continues, the, the decree of holiness, but for a purposeful relationship. Verse 5, he predestined us for what? Adoption. Because we were strangers, we were aliens, we were enemies, and God said, I will choose to glorify myself by bringing these people who rebelled and have chosen, chosen for themselves. I will bring them into my family. I will call them my own. I will make them holy and blameless. I will adopt them into my family. This was his plan from the foundations of the world. This word predestined is used exclusively of God. The work of God where he is free, he is not bound by circumstances or human merit or goodness or potential that people think we, that God looked down the tunnel of time. No, God was completely 
completely free. And what did he do? He predestined these people that did not deserve it, that rejected him, that had sinful hearts to be what? To be a member of his family. J.I. Packer in the book Knowing God says this, Viewed from God's perspective, then, the believer's adoption as son is not an afterthought. It is still less, it is a filial or family disposition that came about by chance or mere accident. On the contrary, the motive and impulse of this new family as adopted sons and daughters finds its springs in its origin in the eternal loving purposes of our Father God who always had in mind to enter into a relationship with us. It has always been the plan of God to enter into this relationship. We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. Before the foundations of the earth, God loved us and chose to bring his people into a relationship. Our pater familia created a people and a family for himself. So you said, well, now I see what Ephesians is telling us about the, the fatherhood of God. What are, what are the implications? What does this matter? So what? Is this just theological stuff? Here are our implications. One, our place in the family of God is fixed for eternity. There are many that worry that am I going to mess up and screw up enough that God is no longer going to want me? Is my sin too great that the love of God cannot cover that any longer? Let me give you the example. My son Crosby is a partika, not because of what he did, even though he's pretty cute and adorable. It's not because of what he did. The reason his name is Partika is because Denise and I chose to love him before he was born. We chose to lavish our love upon that boy so that he would grow up to know that he is a Partika. And as the judge in the courtroom on that day declared him to be our son, it's not revocable. It is God has worked. It is not conditional. It's not based on what Crosby grows up to be. If he's an accountant, a banker, if he makes money, if he runs touchdowns, if he has a beautiful wife, that doesn't matter. Whatever he becomes, he will always be a partika because Denise and I chose to love him and to declare him our son. And that is the confidence that we have as Christians That because salvation and our relationship is a work of the Father before the foundations of the earth, he chose us and made him his sons, we are secure. And we know that even though we mess up and we sin and we have the guilt that torments us about that sin that we mess up time and time again, we can have confidence that it's not an in or out, but it's because of the work of God that we are secure. And then we'll see more. And then the second, the second implication is this. Our life is lived. All of our life, all of our relationship, all of our identity as Christ is lived to the glory of the Father. Notice verse 3. It said, because Paul knows this. Paul knows his adoption. He said, blessed be the God and our Father. Verse 6. God has worked, what? To the praise of his glorious name. And then verse 14. The last phrase to the praise of his, God the Father's, glory. The reason we exist, the reason that we have been given salvation, the reason that we have been made a child of God is not because we're special, even though your mama and your grandmother told you you were special, and and you are. But the reason that you are a part of the family of God is because God is special. And God has chosen to lavish his love on his grace on these these people who did not deserve it, want it, or desire it for the praise of his glorious grace. And all our lives are now lived because of what God has done. We can live to the glory of God and have confidence. When we see the depths of our, our human sin, the response of a child of God is to provide a sense of gratitude. Because of the mercy and the grace that was given to us by our Heavenly Father. We can't help but sing. We can't help but praise because of the work that God has done that lavished his amazing grace on what? A wretch 
like me. He called me his son, and I praise him for that. We see in adoption, we see the father of adoption. But then we also, we see the means of adoption. How th this adoption was able to take place. The father declared the end that we are adopted as sons. It will come to be. We will be in the presence of God for all eternity for those who are his children. But we also see the decree of adoption necessitates or is, it's necessary that reconciliation must happen between God and man. We saw in Sunday school the kingdom of heaven, uh, the kingdom that was created in the garden. What happened? It was torn asunder because of sin, because of pride. And there's a remedy that has to happen because we have been... <clears throat> Because we need reconciliation because our sin has become between this relationship uh, with our God and we have been banished from his presence because he cannot be in the presence of sin. So something must happen. We must be reconciled to God because we have a corrupt family tree. There's a book that started, uh, that was pivotal in our journey of adoption, Denise and I, um, written by Russell Moore. It's called Adopted for Life. I think it will be next month's book of the month, if you want to get a head start on that. And Russell Moore says this, imagine for a moment that you are adopting a child. And as you meet the social worker in the last stage of the process, you're told that the 12-year-old has been out, in and out of psychotherapy since he was three. He persists in burning things and attempting repeatedly to skin kittens alive. He acts out sexually, the social worker said, though she really doesn't fill you in what that means. She continues a little family tree with a little family history. The boy's father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather all have a history of violence, ranging from spousal abuse to serial murder, each of them ending life the same way, death by suicide, each found hanging from a rope of blankets in his prospective cell. I want you to think for a minute. Would you want this child? If you adopt him, would you keep an eye on him as he played with your other children? Would you watch nervously as he looks at the butcher's knife on the kitchen table? Would you leave the room as he watched the movie with your other daughter? Would you want this child? This child is you. This child is me. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us this. And you were dead in trespasses in sin. Verse 3, we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Galatians chapter 5 says, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. We were in an utterly miserable state. Our family tree was rotten by immorality. Our inheritance is bankrupt. Our future is, ho is hopeless. We are destitute. We are enemies, strangers, orphans, aliens and slaves to sin. But I want you to notice, this is the good news of the gospel in verse 5. It says he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ. God the Father declared that he would bring children for himself into his family, and the Son, Jesus Christ, accomplishes that end. It wasn't, it was by the work of Christ that my adoption was secured. Not by my lineage, not by my ability, not by my talent. God has, the Father has declared the end to be adoption, and the means of adoption is through Jesus Christ. Amen? We don't earn our adoption. Christ lavished it upon us. We don't complete our adoption. Christ declared that it is finished. We don't prove our adoption. Christ's resurrection affirms it. The work of Christ pruned us from a family tree of death. And he grafted us into a family tree of life. The end is adoption. The means is the work of Christ. But how? How has he done this? Notice in verse 7. It says, In him we have redemption 
through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. And it says in chapter 2, verse 13, if you flip over one page, it says, Therefore remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by what, by what is called the circumcised, which is made in the flesh of him. Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth. And verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. To redeem is to pay the penalty, pay the ransom, to be freed from your captive. And we were captive to our sin. We are captive to a degenerative family tree of sin. And Jesus Christ came and he bore the wrath that we deserve as sinful people to make us alive and to make us children of God. It was the pater familias who decreed our adoption and decreed our adoption through Christ's propitiation or the fact that he paid the penalty for our sin as we sing in the hymn, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. What did Jesus do? He washed it white as snow. The implications of Christ. Christ coming and, and paying the ransom. Christ coming and bearing the wrath of God on our behalf is that we do not need to earn or to justify our adoption. When I was a little boy, I was about 13 months old. When I was adopted, I was 18 pounds. Uh, my foster family uh, was going through a divorce and I was feeling the effects of that. I ate whatever I possibly could uh, to be able to please my mother, my new mother, my adoptive mother, Lucy. You'll meet her in a few months. I did everything I could possibly, I ate like everything and I put on all kinds of weight because I was trying to justify the, uh, my adoption to her. And I clung to my father and I wouldn't let him go. But I realize now that I was secure as a partika. Not because that I ate all the food and clung to my father and act cute and, and, and spoke on command or did whatever things they asked me to do. I was safe and I was secure because of the work that my parents had already done. It was completed. It was done. I was declared a child of God because of the work of my parents. And our position in the family of God is steadfast and unmovable because of Jesus. So when the Satan tempts you to despair, as the hymn will, will sing, and tells you of the guilt within, upward we look and find him there who made an end to all our sin. When Satan tells you and he lies to you and deceives you, he says that your sin is too great. That your sin, that God would never have called you a child if he knew about this. All you need to do is point to the cross. Point to the cross where the, the debt was paid, the wrath was poured out, and our adoption was made secure. And so when we despair, say, you're absolutely right, I am a sinner. I don't deserve the, a place in the family of God. But Jesus gave me his grace anyway, and he worked and went to the cross, and I cling to the cross of Christ. We don't need to earn or justify our adoption. The price was paid. We are no longer like our birth parents. We're no longer like that lineage, that family tree that we had. It says that we have been grafted. We have been given a new heart, a new nature, a new family tree, a new destiny. Because of the work of Christ on the cross. And that's why we take joy in the gospel. We understand the workings of the father of adoption. The, house, or the, the means of adoption, but we also now know the household of adoption. The end is to be adopted. The means is Christ, and the community is the household of God. We have a new identity. We have a new family. If you look at verse, chapter 2, verse 11, it says, 
Therefore, remember at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision, which was made in the flesh by hand. Remember that you were at that time separated, alienated, and strangers, having no hope and without God in this world. There was a division between the people of God and everybody else. And now notice, because of the work of God, this new identity and this new position in verse 19. So you are no longer, because of the work of Christ that he has done on the cross, because of the declaration of the Father for adoption, verse 19, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of what? The household of God. Built on the foundation of the apostles, the New Testament writers, and the prophets the Old Testament writers, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. We have a new relationship. We have a new identity. We have a new household. We have a new pater familia, a new father who has brought us into this family. Our position is that we are justified and we are reconciled. Not simply being declared innocent. We're not, we're not just innocent, but we're declared a child. Often what happens in our Bible studies, we think of that we're not guilty anymore. We think of a criminal court. In a criminal court, you go before a jury and a judge, and they review the evidence, and you are declared guilty or not guilty. Often what happens, if you are declared not guilty, the judge fells his gavel, says you are not guilty, and you are free to go. And you leave. You walk out of the courthouse, thankful that nothing happened, but you're just not guilty. Now, rather than taking a left into the criminal court, I would encourage you to take a right into the adoption court. In the adoption court, the justification that we have before God, we stand before the judge of the universe who sees us that we are guilty and that we do not deserve the grace of God and that we have violated his holiness. And he says this, you're not guilty. And in that verdict, not only does he declare us not guilty, but he says, you are my child. So not only does the great judge declare us not guilty, but he says, you are my child. In that moment of being declared not guilty, we have a new identity. It changes immediately because we are now sons of the almighty God, the judge of the universe. And it completely changes the trajectory and the course of our life because of the work and the justification of the holy God, our judge. We are no longer just not guilty. We are his children because of the work and the declaring of our father. And behold, what manner of love the Father has given unto us, what? That we should be called the sons of God. What a reason to rejoice. And because of that, because of the work of God, I want you to notice Ephesians chapter 4. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1. I, therefore, Paul speaking, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to do what? Walk in a manner worthy of your calling. What is your calling? That you have been called out of sin and you've been given a new identity. You are now an adopted child of God. And because of that, what happens now? We are free. We have been given a new heart, a new nature, a new desire that we can walk worthy in the manner that God has called us. And it says, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love. What was once unable for us to attain is now we are enabled and we are empowered by the Holy Spirit of God who works in our hearts that we can now bear the fruit of the Spirit in righteousness and we can walk worthy of the manner. Now, because God has declared us sons, Christ has done the work and the means of our adoption. Now we have the household that we are to reflect the glory of our God. We reflect and live like our Heavenly Father in our business transactions. How we control our temper. How we speak the truth in love. That we don't steal, but we work. We, the, the topics of our speech, the encouragement that we give. That we no longer live in bitterness and wrath and anger and slander of one another. 
we reflect the manner of God in our sexual ethics. That we are not full of wine, but we're full of the Spirit of God. That we are kind to one another, tender-hearted and forgiving. Why? Because we are children of the Heavenly Father. And every action that we do reflects the work and the glory of our Heavenly Father. In, in Ephesians 4 through 6, this new dynamic happens and, and it, he begins to look at all the different members of the household of God. The, uh, our adoption is reflected in how, husbands, how you love your wives self-sacrificially. Your adoption in wives is reflected in how you submit to your husband's leadership. Children, your adoption is shown in how you obey your parents. In slaves and employees, how you obey your masters and your, your bosses. Bosses, how you treat your employee is a reflection of your identity in Christ. All of that is walking worthy in a manner of your calling. We are connected in this community of faith. We have one heavenly father who we say, our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The implication of living in the household of God, in the family of God, with one father, with brothers and sisters, is profound. That we should love greatly. We should love greatly as people who have been lavished the grace of God. Romans 5, 8, but God showed his love to us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died to bring us into his home. In 1 John 4, 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. The cost was great. Uh, the adoption of Crosby was not easy. Adoption is not for the faint of heart. There were many tears, heartbreaks, sleepless nights, doubt, uh, miles put on the car driving to Ohio. Why did we do this? Why was the cost so great, even financially? Why? Because that, so we could call him a partika. He could have left us in our sin and poured his wrath upon us like we deserved. However, he chose us, he redeemed us, he forgave us, and he called us his son. And now, we love greatly our brothers and sisters in Christ, we love greatly our God, but now, we also have a father that will teach us. Psalm 68 talks about he is the father to the fatherless. He teaches us what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a child of the one true king, just as in my life, I teach my son and I teach my daughter and I teach the little squirt in the back what it means to be a partika, what it means that they have my name. I love them, I discipline, I encourage them, I'm firm with them and I discipline, not them to just make them angry and, and to be nasty to them. I do that because I love them and I want them to know what it means to be a partika. As my son plays on the football field, he has his name on my jersey. As my daughter walks around in her sweatshirt, she has my name on her sweatshirt. They are reflections of me and I work and I love them to show them what it means to be a partika. Just as my father looked me in the eye when I was being stupid and selfish and he said, son, that's not what partikas do. And he disciplined and he loved me and he works. We have this new relationship. God is no longer this tyrant who works to beat us down. He is a loving heavenly father. He works to make us and to mold us into his image. And often we struggle with that because of the relationships with our earthly fathers. But we have to realize that God is working and making us into his image. We have a father to teach us, a father of adoption who has declared us to be his son. He has, we have the means of adoption in the completed work of Christ. We no longer have to strive to prove that we are worthy because the work on Calvary has been completed. And then we have a household. We have a family. We have a loving father who is working things for our good, even then when the discipline is painful and it hurts him more than it hurts us. And we don't believe him. Why? Because we are not where we need to be and he's molding us into his image. Finally, I close with a quote from J.I. Packer. 
If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how they much they make out of being God's child and having God as father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. Our understanding of Christianity cannot be better than our grasp of adoption. Lord, open our eyes to see the truth. The truth that you have declared us your son. That you, through Jesus Christ, had came and laid down your life to bear the wrath of God, Lord, and you have brought us into your household, into your family, and our actions reflect our Heavenly Father who is molding us and making us like Christ, into making him into the image of our Heavenly Father. Lord, and we praise and we thank you for all eternity because of the work that was done and our place that was declared and our identity in the family of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.